Shin Tov Jai. Um, thank you so much to uh, Alicia and to Jacob and to everybody who worked so hard to organize this conference. Um, it was some months ago in Perugia where we first talked and I didn't know what to expect and I'm not sure you knew what to expect yet. So <laughs> here we are with what, we, um, with what you created and it's really a wonderful thing. Um, I also want to um, give a special thank you to Robert Soka, uh, a Neiman Fellow of mine from two years ago, a great journalist from Krakow who's come to the conference, and it's really good to, to see him um, again. So I'm not sure my talk is so much skeptical. Um, I don't think it is. I think it's um, aspirational, and I think it is, um, I hope it is. Um, it's about, um, it's a little bit about how we think of technology in terms of our stories, but very much in keeping with the theme of this conference, story first. Um, I think that's, that is definitely the theme I, um, I try to sound. So let's see, um, we will start. Uh, the week before New Year's in 2012, my family and I traveled to a remote ranch in Texas um, to say goodbye to Paul Solopek. Paul is one of the preeminent journalists of his generation, uh, a reporter with patient powers of observation, a writer of poetic cadence, uh, whose stories on Africa and on mapping the human genome earned him two Pulitzer Prizes before the age of 40. That New Year's, Paul was leaving on a very long trip a 21,000 mile trip, and he was walking. After years of entering and exiting people's stories in a hurry, he wanted to report, he said, at the beat of his footsteps. Following months of planning, he flew to Africa, he rented camels, then began his odyssey retracing the path of human migration from Ethiopia to, inshallah, Patagonia. He imagined it would take him six years, but that was six years ago. He has only recently made it to India. Legions of readers around the world follow his growing archive of writing, video, audio, and photography that document our modern epoch. I no longer ask Paul when he thinks he will be done. My friend will be walking and writing for the rest of his life, a Pied Piper for what he calls slow journalism. In setting across the world by foot, Paul was decidedly rejecting parachute reporting, a journalistic convention further cheapened by the technologies that permit us to assume knowledge of people and their stories, sometimes without ever talking to them. At the same time, the richness of Paul's stories would not have been possible without the use of those same technologies that connect his walk to the world. Sustaining this journey are backpacks of smartphones, audio recording devices, GPS tracking, satellite phones, and more carried by donkeys, camels, and Paul and his occasional walking partners. Social media, uh, have enabled a rapport between Paul and his readers that his previous newspaper work did not. And a new translation tool managed by volunteers has allowed him to publish more than 200 translations across 16 languages, including Polish now. Thanks to growing access, nomads along Paul's path sometimes see stories on their phones before even he has seen them posted. One of the wonderful features of the Out of Eden Walk occurs every 100 miles as Paul stops to take and post six samples, ambient sound, photos of the earth where he stands, photo of the sky under which he stands, a panorama of his current location, a short video, an interview. Not that long ago, these features would not have been possible from such remote outposts. While it is Paul's resolve and creativity that fuel his work, broadband makes it possible. Paul calls these transects, and the rich weave of multimedia seems to literally slow time whenever I watch and listen. But his real motivation is that of every great storyteller, to leave behind 
a nuanced record of the world as he touched it and heard it and experienced it, not only as someone described it to him. By the end, Paul has said, I'll have created an enduring portrait of a storytelling transect around the world at the end of the millennium. We recently uh, welcomed Shaheen Pasha, an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, to his visiting fellowship at the Neiman Foundation. She came to research prison education programs and to create an immersive teaching and reporting model for university journalism programs to partner with prisons in creating journalism curriculum for inmates. But to me, an understated benefit of that work was the way in which it would put journalism students in direct contact with story subjects, which is currently kind of a radical idea in a lot of programs. Um, those students and many of you are of a generation who learned that they don't always need to leave their desks or kitchen counters to complete an assignment. Entire stories acquitted through phone or email correspondence or simply the curation of other people's work is perfectly common. Given the restrictions in most corrections facilities, a prison curriculum was putting students, some of them for the very first time, in face-to-face -face contact with their subjects. In thinking about what innovation I could talk about from the front lines of journalism, it was this, the power of human connection amplified by our most sophisticated man-made tools, tools which for all of their genius are just handmaidens to our eyes and ears, aids to human connection, not replacements. By Paul's reckoning, it is from slowing our observations while everything around us is accelerating that new generations of storytelling and cultural innovation will emerge. Reporters have written stories about the technology Salopec has harnessed to make this arduous trip possible, yet those are but the enabling tools that support his strengths as a journalistic poet, playwright, painter. Listen to this passage from a recent dispatch out of Afghanistan's extremely remote Wakhan corridor. Urshad Pass rises 16,335 feet above sea level. We finally reached it at sunset. Matthew Paley, one of his walking partners and photographer, ventured a feeble victory dance. I gulped air so thin and metallic it cut my lungs like razor blades. Gales had scoured the summit to raw bedrock. Without shelter or firewood, it was a hazardous place to camp, but we had little choice. A bitter dark was rising fast from the deep valleys. We unpacked our donkeys with difficulty. The ropes were stiff as rebar and pounded our tent stakes into iron-cold earth. My frozen pants never thawed, not even inside my sleeping bag. I staggered out into the howling night only once to wrap the donkeys in fluttering tarps. The animal's black eyes shone back accusingly in the white bore of my headlamp. I couldn't look at them. Not long after I returned from Texas that New Year's weekend, I happened upon a lecture by Harvard art historian Jennifer Roberts. She was advancing a radical notion, slowing time. She spoke of this in relation to the 18th century John Singleton Copley painting called Boy with a Flying Squirrel, a treasure of Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. It is one of the two or three most important paintings made in colonial America and one that Roberts knew well. But she sat before the painting challenging herself to practice deceleration, patience, and deep attention. Patient, she argues, is now so undervalued and her students so pressured for immediacy that she must mandate slow learning, requiring them to spend three hours away from campus at the museum observing a painting without the aid or interruption of the digital universe. How often do any of us spend three waking hours unplugged? Vision, Roberts argues, has become the master sense for the delivery of information in the contemporary technological world. And those of us who are sighted believe that we can see instantly without study. But these exercises with her students have demonstrated otherwise. Just because you have looked at something, she says, doesn't mean you have seen it. 
She illustrated her point by cataloging the insights that eluded even her, a brilliant art historian, until deep into her three-hour observation of the Copley painting. She would write, it took me nine minutes to notice that the shape of the boy's ear precisely echoes that of the ruff along the squirrel's belly, and that Copley was making some kind of connection between the animal and the human body and the sensory capacities, sensory capacities of each. It was 21 minutes before I registered the fact that the fingers holding the chain exactly span the diameter of the water glass beneath them. It took a good 45 minutes before I realized that the seemingly random folds and wrinkles in the background curtain are actually perfect copies of the shapes of the boy's ear and eye, as if Copley had imagined those sensory organs distributing or imprinting themselves on the surface behind him, and so on. Robert's conclusion is a, wildly, is a quietly radical notion. Patience, she says, is in itself an innovation in the current temporal world. She believes that unless we engineer these purposeful opportunities for observing, that they will disappear. If, like I often do, you, you're sitting through the short talk unable to resist the digital siren in your backpack or pocket, you know what she means. These are the kinds of experiences, she said wistfully, that are no longer available in nature. It wasn't until I was sorting my thoughts for talks this week that I made the connection between Paul Salopek and Jennifer Roberts, the journalist and the art historian speaking to each other across disciplines, each of them arguing for more time in order to perceive that which we have yet to see or the connection between Paul's epic journey and the young students in Shaheen Pasha's prison reporting class who are learning the value of journalism up close, untethered from the machinery whose virtues are vast, but only mimic direct connection and observation. Arguing for time can be heretic in journalism, where time spent can be seen as time wasted, the arms race to be first rather than better, now rather than nuanced, networked rather than novel, is a rising value, not just in our industry, but more broadly in the culture. Both Salopek and Roberts have rejected, uh, used technology, but reject its crude intrusions on their basic work. Even as Paul's odyssey depends on the signals that allow him to locate himself on the planet or communicate with audiences that only know him through their devices. But the medium is not his message. Last weekend, the New York Times brought us to an intriguing intersection, exploring dazzling storytelling that suggested one possible future, even as it relied on primordial human technologies, our eyes and ears, and deep sensory connection to our environments. Here is a cover uh, of the print edition of the New York Times Sunday Magazine, a nearly wordless magazine that Sunday, devoted to travel photography, a delicious visual treat, but this magazine, its editor said, was a sonic voyage. As I leafed through the print, I listened on my iPad to rich and sonorous soundtracks of lava flowing in Hawaii, sounding like broken glass, the wind blowing through trees in Utah, rats in New York City vocalizing what a scientist called honest-to-goodness laughter. Um, I want to, uh, just for those of you who may not have experienced this, I want to, uh, if I can, play, play some of what um, the Times recorded and shared with its, with its readers. Um, so here we are in Madagascar. Now we're going to leave Hawaii and travel halfway around the world to Muromaizaha, Madagascar, to hear an unusual sound from the animal kingdom. It's actually kind of a romantic sound because, oh, hold on, hold on. This is a lemur, a particular kind of lemur called an indri. Dr. Valeria Torti is a biologist at the University of Turin who studies them very closely. This sound is uh, the largest living lemurs. 
They are found only in Madagascar, and they are known for these incredible cries that are called songs. So the, the males are, and the females are singing differently. Uh, males' notes are more modulated, that they are more like a while the notes of the female are more like a They are monogamous, so stop there. There's more labors. <laughs> um, I just love that. Uh, and just to, just to sort of show you the richness of the variety um, in this piece, um, I'll just share a little bit more. We're going to go to uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Or not. Just like smell and taste, our sense of sound is deeply connected to memory. Soundscapes make a powerful imprint on us. Nigerian sound artist Emeka Ogbo has been recording bus stations in Lagos for years. For him, and for Lagosians everywhere, these recordings can be deeply nostalgic. I occasionally get this email, someone telling me, you know, I miss home so much, you know, I bumped into your, you know, the, your recordings that are online, and I'm sitting in the middle of my kitchen, somewhere in Europe or somewhere in the States, and I'm playing the soundscape of Lagos Loud. I mean, that's all I'm playing on loop, because I miss home, you know. One of his favorite places to record is Ojuelaba. Ojuelaba is one of the most popular bus stations in Lagos. Felakuti mentioned it in a, his song, Confusion, where he talked about car coming from the south, car coming from the north, car coming from the east, car coming from the west, and there's no one in the middle to control it, so there's confusion. There's so many layers of sound going on in these spaces, so there are a lot of hawkers calling out their words, preachers selling salvation, traffic, moving cars, passing cars, people on the phone, people in the bus, bus conductors calling out the bus routes. The bus conductor is actually one of my favorite personalities to record. Bus stations to the I'll stop there, but I really um, urge you, if you've not experienced this um, this this issue uh, of the Times Magazine, to go spend some time with it. They'll take you to lots of other um, places in the world. And um, what I really just love about this is um, the way it breaks. It sort of forces us to break down and separate our senses and really. Um, use each of them with deep intent. Um, and I think um, there is a connection to what Paul is doing with his work, to what Professor Roberts is asking us to do and what she is doing um, with her work, um, that this magazine issue um, explores uh, and really takes advantage of. And the recording and the digital prowess needed for this to ex succeed was not insignificant, and they had tremendous talent working on that. But technology was not alone the success story here, uh, nor was it, I think, the hardest part. The real work, that was on us. Taking the time to listen for what could feel like the first time. Every year, I ask each of my Neiman Fellows, as Robert can tell you, to give a talk in answer to the prompt, why I do what I do. It seems like a simple question, but trust me, to do it well, it is deceptively difficult. Because we do what we do and we often don't think about it. Um, try to understand the deepest impulses and what we are trying to achieve with our work. And so I would ask each of you, what's your answer to that question? And have you organized your work um, or your ambitions for your work, whatever they may be, to best live up to that answer? 
Um, and you needn't walk across the planet to realize those. Um, in closing, I will leave you with Paul's words from a recent interview with Vice. One part of one man's answer to a fundamental query that each of us should be asking of ourselves all the time. And this is how he explains it. This project was devised as a way to subvert the conventions of the digital media industry, to go diametrically in the opposite direction that we're all headed, faster, shallower. I believe there's space for longer, hopefully more thoughtful storytelling in our lives, and walking accomplishes this. By moving at five clicks an hour through the main stories of our time, I think I gather a better understanding and make connections that others ping-ponging between stories and planes and cars miss all the time. It's basically experiencing the news as a form of pilgrimage. Shinkuya.